I think it will take around 30 it's minutes. Around yeah. Okay. I, I don't expect it to be more, maybe less. Okay. But you know, sometimes you never you know. Don't, this you thing. Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I rehearsed it. I think you know we're looking at around 30 minutes. That's a goal. I thought actually it would be 45, but I mean, I was planning to leave room for questions. Ah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's 10 minutes per question. Hmm. Okay, I don't know if you are. Um, it's okay. It's okay. We can wait. Is this um, from the previous? I'm seeing that we're definitely doing better than the next, <laughs> than the room next, in terms of people. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the auditorium yeah. is still going on, so maybe a bit more. Yeah, okay. here, I mean, we're full. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Normal, normal. I spoke uh, last year as well. Yeah. Was last year was about. It was called making recommendations without data. The talk. Oh. Wow. <laughs> but it was more about how do you make recommendations when um, you don't have you know prior information about people. The cold start problem when you know <coughs> a new user goes to Netflix and Netflix has to recommend some movies. And you have not tried seeing the movie before? Not really, oh, so... Like not for a user that is just uh, registering, right? About his movie preferences, uh, for example, in Netflix. In our case, I worked with Ruby in uh, that previous startup. We wanted to uh, uh, connect you with some uh, interesting, let's say, groups of other people, but we didn't have any clue which groups you would like before. And we had to use some sort of information from uh, from your prof from your Facebook profile to kind of do similarity search okay. rather than do collaborative filtering or something like that. Mm, okay. I was interested. It was my first time speaking. It was in that room. That, that's, yeah, that room is more stressful, I think. I think maybe not. <laughs> this is more cozy. Yeah. The expectations in this room are higher. Kind of. <laughs> people are sitting down. Okay. So we start when it hits five. We want to start when the auditorium so finishes.
but the bug? Ah, yeah. I mean, I can. Expectations of this talk are definitely high. <laughs> it just means that people are interested, for sure, in that sense. Okay, hello everyone. So next speaker will be Nick from uh, Cedars and he'll be com comparing oh, okay. he'll be comparing the explanatory and projective what? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> explanatory and predictive power of different kind of models. So please welcome him. So, hi everyone, welcome to my talk. Let me uh, spend a few moments uh, telling you more about myself and the motivation behind this talk. So, my name is Nick Soros. I studied at Imperial College, where I did my thesis in computer vision. I have been in the industry for around four years, uh, mainly working in startups. Uh, and I started as a software engineer, but quickly transitioned into data science. I now work uh, as a data scientist uh, at Cedars. Cedars is an equity crowdfunding platform, sort of like Kickstarter, but instead of getting a product, you get shares back in a company. We were founded, founded in 2012, and we are a 60 plus strong team. Now, who, who, let me ask you a question. Who here comes from, would say comes from a background of machine learning? And who would say comes more, f identifies more from, uh, with a background of statistics or uh, economics? Okay. Um, I was expecting, to be honest, more of a 90% coming from the machine learning world and more of 10% instead of 50-50. But I still uh, hope that some of you will uh, still identify with some of uh, the questions I had around the differences between explanatory modeling and predictive modeling and also share some of the confusion. My personal motivation for this talk has been, um, has been long in the making, since uh, I always felt there was a void in my training around the differences between explanatory and predictive modeling. And um, trying to answer that question, what is the difference, I found that paper, which I highly recommend you read if you're interested in the subject, uh, which provided me with uh, which provided me with a lot of answers um, and um, motivated me to give this talk. Let me start with some definitions so we know what I refer to when I say explanatory modeling and predictive modeling. So when I say explain or explanatory modeling, I mean, I mean building a statistical modeling to, make, um, to test causal hypothesis. This is how I define explanatory modeling and predictive modeling is when we're doing statistical modeling with the goal to make predictions from new examples. OK, so these are the definitions I'm going to be using for, this to the, uh, for these two things. The talk is split in three parts. In the first part, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to showcase some questions that might arise that will uh, show us the difference between explanatory and predictive modeling uh, with an example uh, more close to the area where I work. Then we're going to try to, um, I'm going to try to sh break down the modeling, uh, the modeling we do uh, into uh, steps and see how different uh, decisions need to be made when you're trying to do explanatory modeling and predictive modeling. And then I'm going to share some takeaway points. So 
In the first part, I want to answer two main questions. And these are, what techniques uh, are more suitable for explanatory modeling versus predictive modeling? And wh what other techniques are more suitable for ex uh, predictive modeling? And what sort of data questions uh, swing the balance between using explanatory modeling, uh, swing the balance between using one versus the other? So let's start with um, loading our data. In my area, this would look something like this. Bear in mind that this is fake data, but in my, uh, in my area, uh, equity crowdfunding, our data would look something like this, okay? So we would load our data if we wanted to understand more about, and the task at hand would be something like understanding campaign success. What is it that make equity crowdfunding campaigns succeed? So for example, you might have variables such as angel investment, whether the campaign that uh, seeks to raise funding comes with uh, some angel investment beforehand, what percentage of the, of the goal of the campaign is covered of the goal that the campaign uh, seeks to, uh, the, or the money that they seek to raise uh, will get covered in the first week uh, of uh, the campaign, whether there is any tax incentive in the campaign for the investors, or whether they have a partner, for example, Sitcom or any other sort of incubator, uh, some campaigns come straight from those uh, programs. And we're trying to understand when a uh, hit target happens, when they manage to raise this money. So okay, so we know how to do that, right? Easy. <clears throat> we will um, split our data into train and test. We will pick an algorithm, SVM. It's a good algorithm. It works quite well. And we will train it. And then we will have an algorithm, a statistical model that does this job. It gives us the answer, given a new example, tells us which com whether a campaign will succeed according to our algorithm with an accuracy uh, that we can calculate. But then an entrepreneur comes in and asks you the question, OK, since you now have a model, can you tell me what is it that I can do that makes my campaign, that will make my campaign succeed? What is the most important thing I should focus on to make my, my campaign succeed? Or for example, asks, is the tax incentive for investor a crucial thing to have in order to succeed? OK, no problem. We can do that still. We will use a feature selection technique. We will, pick, we will pick an algorithm of our choice that is in the category of feature selection, which will give us an idea on which of the features of our algorithm are important, first of all, so we can know. Um, what are the most important things an entrepreneur can do, and it will also tell us whether the tax incentive is inside any of those. But then think about the legal department coming to you and says, remember this algorithm you built that we now use to make uh, predictions about whether a campaign will succeed, that um, by, which, by which we decide whether a campaign will come through the platform or not on its probability to succeed? Now the regulator wants us to explain the model to them. So okay, we didn't build that model in order to explain the decision that the algorithm does. Um, so let's backtrack and use another algorithm that is mu much, more <coughs> much more interpretable. We may lose a little bit on accuracy, but we'll gain a lot in, ter in interpretability. It's an easy if-then-else if then sort of situation that we can explain to the regulator, we can explain to the legal department, and everyone wins. But what happened to the tax incentive? What happens if we want to know how important is the tax incentive? Obviously, we still know whether it is important. We have the information gate. But how important is it? And um, how important is it? Like, these are the type of questions. We're, we're, we're uh, approaching the type of questions we are, which are more suitable for a different type of model, which is regression. Now, regression is obviously a very simplistic model, but it's a super interpretable one. It gives us the opportunity to argue how important specific factors are in the model and whether they are statistically significant. So it not only gives us interpretability, we know which things are important for a, a campaign in our case to succeed. We also know whether these things are statistically significant. Okay. And there's also a lot of theory behind regression on how to do that. How can we use it in order to properly explain things? What I'm trying to say is that there are two dimensions when you were doing modeling. And this is the ability to explain and the ability to predict. And there are some uh, techniques 
that come with uh, that are more naturally uh, easier to interpret. So they come with better ability to explain, for example, linear regression. And there are some other models that are more suitable for prediction, and they have a higher ability to predict. By which I mean that they have the uh, the they have the property to cap to capture complex relationships in our data, like neural nets. So in the second part, I'm going to try to break the steps down into uh, the modeling we usually do and try to see how in each step of the process of modeling, we have to make different decisions when we're aiming to explain versus when we're aiming to predict. So first things first, this is a long debate in the philosophy of science on what is, uh, on whether uh, essentially the premise is that science is an endeavor of understanding the world and um, progressing knowledge. And uh, predictive modeling is not um, necessarily helping us uh, know more about what is happening in the model. So a lot of people are considering uh, predictive modeling to be unscientific, whereas explanatory modeling to be the real science. I don't share that view, but this is a debate. And you can easily see that by looking at the publications in specific sort of um, fields in academia. This is why I asked you the question in the beginning. Okay, so if you if you go in a social sciences uh, type of uh, journal, for example, economics, psychology, you will find a vast amount of uh, journals being uh, a vast amount of research being published that is using explanatory modeling techniques mainly, and only few will use. Uh, any sort of predictive uh, modeling approach. And if you go to computer, a computer science department or journal, you will mainly see more examples from predictive modeling, think machine learning, and far fewer from the explanatory approach. So there seems to be a divide between, uh, between the two. This is fake data, <laughs> uh, but you can you can actually uh, if you yeah I mean this is a way you can approach that like you can go and see how many how many of the techniques that you identified as you know regression or um, so the difference comes from uh, something quite simple and that is that when you want to explain something okay you want to create a construct for example, intelligence, that you then, in order to create a statistical model, you want to operationalize by creating something that is measurable, for example, IQ score. And it is this exact operationalization of your constructs that creates the disparity between our ability to explain things and our ability to predict things. More mathematically speaking, when we're trying to model, we're trying to minimize error. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find an F, our model, that given our observable data, x, uh, uh, come close to y. As we know, we can decompose that into bias and variance. Okay. Bias is the distance we are away from the actual model that is producing the data in the world, whereas variance is the, tries to capture the complexity of our model. So when we want to explain something, we are seeking to get as close as possible to the actual model that is producing the data. That is minimizing the bias. But when we're trying to predict things, we're trying to minimize the combined bias and variance. So we're trying to sometimes minimize variance, the complexity of our model, at the expense of increasing bias, the distance away we are from the true model, in order to be able to minimize the error. Think regularization, for example. So let's go to each step of the modeling as we know it. And I come from a machine learning background, so this is how it looks usually, and see the things that are different when we're trying to explain versus predict. So things are different straight away. So when we're doing pre-processing, in explanatory modeling, we only care <coughs> We only care about the minimum amount, we, we usually care about the minimum amount of data we need in order to be able to do, to make a statistically significant claim, to, to test a causal hypothesis using a statistical test. That's why usually when you're reading some uh, research that has used an explanatory modeling technique, the first step is to calculate the sample size. And this is the absolute minimum sample that a researcher needs in order to be able to conduct his hypothesis. 
as you probably know, in the predictive modeling world, we're much more data hungry. And for good reason, because this, has, this gives us the ability to generalize, to generalize more. It gives us the ability to do cross-validation, things that are not of interest in the explanatory modeling. Sorry, what's the difference between N and synthesis? What is the difference? What, what's N? I think it's the, I'm not, I'm not sure, I just copied, I have to be honest, I just copied, I think it's, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I think this is just the, um, this is uh, the, the formula you use in order to calculate, you know, uh, when you're trying to make a, stat like a statistical, like let's say you want to, uh, in the, the p-value usually is how much confident you want to be about the claim you want to make in your statistical test, and z is usually from the distribution. Uh, from the normal distribution that you're running your test, your, the t-test, I think, uh, the t-distribution, and I assume n to be the, I'm not sure, actually, I'm not sure. n is the population sample size is the minimum amount you need to get certain confidence. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what it is, but I just wanted to kind of like bring a formula. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you, yeah. Then, then moving on, in the feature engineering type of things, there are two main differences uh, that you need to take into account. First of all, um, when you're doing explanatory modeling, you're interested in uh, the variables that you use have to be things that you can interpret. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to just have columns in your data set that are not interpretable. Whereas in the predictive modeling side of things, you um, you, you, you don't really care about whether you can interpret things as long as this, the data that are in your data, um, in your data set, uh, have, a, have a, um, an effect in your accuracy. This is referred to in the paper as theory versus data. Okay, so hence sometimes we use uh, techniques in uh, predictive modeling that kind of lose that interpretability. We, we do dimensionality reduction, uh, which is not an option here. The other difference is, is whether a variable is available uh, uh, in prediction time, okay? So for example, in predictive modeling, since we're building an algorithm to predict something, we really care whether the variables that we're using to build the model are available at the time of prediction. In this example, if we wanted to predict whether a campaign will succeed at the time where it comes into our platform, we wouldn't be able to use the percent that's covered in week one, how much money it raised during the first week that it went live, because this uh, information wouldn't be available. On the other side, in explanatory modeling, we rarely care about whether a variable will be available in prediction, because all we care about is to really understand the phenomenon and what causes that phenomenon. Then, then it comes modeling. We need to pick a model. So straight out of the box, there are a lot of models that are not suitable for, explan uh, for explanatory uh, modeling. For example, two, two main uh, category, categories of model that are really popular among uh, predictive modelers uh, are, for example, ensemble methods, uh, which are methods that combine multiple algorithms uh, and produce a result, like random forest, you cannot use that uh, when you're doing explanatory modeling because you cannot interpret them. And shrinkage methods, as I said previously, if you want to uh, do dimensionality reduction to use PCA straight, uh, instantly you actually lose the interpretability of your variables. So this type of uh, methodologies are out of question for um, explanatory modeling. As you see, there are far more restrictions into what type of models you can use when, when you're trying to explain. And finally, it's model evaluation. So you're trying to do a different thing when you're trying to explain versus when you're trying to predict. When you're trying to explain, you're interested in finding and minimizing that bias. So there are other measures you use, goodness, which are categorized in goodness, uh, they are named as goodness of fit, where you're trying to, to measure how close you are into the model uh, you've built. Whereas when we're doing prediction, the only thing we care about is what is the accuracy of our model. So we use measures as predictive accuracy. So in this step of the way, we also there are different uh, evaluation metrics. So what are the takeaway points from uh, this talk? The first point for me is that predictive models are better at prediction. Okay, and by which I mean that when the task at hand is to do prediction, 
It might be obvious to this room, but when the task at hand is to do prediction, you should use a predictive model. In reality, when we're doing election forecasting, for example, which is an area populated by economists or statisticians, they usually use what they're most familiar with, which is explanatory modeling techniques and regression. So it's no surprise that these techniques fell short when it comes to accuracy a lot of, uh, a lot of the times, like here. The second takeaway po uh, point for me is mostly for us, for predictive modeling slash machine learning type uh, background of people. And it is, at the very least, when we're trying to do, when we're trying to explain things, we should use an explanatory modeling technique. Um, secondly, there is, um, there, is a, there is an ethical dimension to, um, to what we're doing. Um, a lot of the algorithms that we build are uh, being used to make decisions. Uh, for example, whether someone will, uh, will go on trial. Uh, for this exact reason, from 2018, we will have uh, all companies that use algorithms to make uh, decisions, they would have to report to regulators and the subjects, they, they would have to be able to report what the algorithm does. Um, but there's also another uh, takeaway point here, which is that if we don't strive to explain what our model is doing, we're not really getting any closer into understanding what is happening. For example, if we're building a neural net that tries to uh, classify an image, we're not getting any closer to understand how the, work, how the brain works. So I hope I convinced you about two things here. One is that explanation and prediction are not competing. There are two dimensions. Uh, there are two dimensions that you can consider. There are models that are better in explanation and models that are better to predict. And I hope that tech, next time that you would want to do modeling, you would ask this question. What am I trying to model for? Am I trying to explain the thing? Uh, am I, do I have an explanation task at hand? Or do I have a prediction task at hand? And you would use the most relevant technique for that. Questions? Yeah, so that's a hard question, thank you. Um, but I think this, um, uh, and I was kind of expecting someone to ask something like that. Uh, I think the, the essence of the question is the following. There is, uh, there is, there is obviously, uh, you can obviously do some sort of feature selection technique, okay? Uh, in which you will obviously uh, start thinking about uh, what are the features that best uh, that best uh, are best to predict uh, the outcome of something? But in reality, if you do this, if you do any sort of feature selection technique in order to identify what are you know the features that um, that uh, like uh, do a prediction, you wouldn't be using uh, you wouldn't be using any of the theory on, on how you uh, on how good your model is in capturing something. So as far as I'm aware, the way I would go about doing what you just said is using regression. Because there's a lot of theory behind how can I model given, assuming that we, we have identified the features that we have. And the only thing we want to do is we want to claim, we want to see whether these features are statistically significant, not important necessarily, but statistically significant. We will run a statistical test for that which is not necessarily the same type of question that the feature selection techniques do, because something might be important for prediction. It might be important, but not statistically significant. So, this, so hence, we don't care about it in an explanatory 
type of uh, model technique. But I think this is an open question, to be honest, where you know the, the, the real question is, is how these two fields, what can these two fields learn from each other? How we can kind of use the techniques we, we see and we know in predictive modeling that uh, perform really well and kind of, kind of open them up, make them more interpretable. I think that is the real question, which I don't think there is an uh, answer yet. I think it's an open question in machine learning. Yeah. So the yeah. So the the case I've worked with is the case I presented with the fake data. But in reality, this is you know what I do. I was actually my first task when I joined Cedars was to explain you know what what causes campaign success. I was also kind of progressing on uh, the research of some people that came bef uh, before me that used explanatory modeling techniques. So it was kind of my motivation as well to kind of understand what's going on there. But an example of a problem which made sense to use explanatory modeling was the problem I had at hand, which was what is that makes, you know, like a campaign succeed by how much and how we can, you know, influence, how, how can we trans how we can create a model that we will then base our advice that we give to our inter entrepreneurs uh, in from. Uh, but I think, as I said, like there is an ethical, I haven't worked in this other problem, but there is an ethical uh, thing going on here, which is there are algorithms out there that are being used to make decisions about us every day, uh, which are at the moment black boxes. And sometimes they don't wor wor work really well. They are biased in different sort of ways. I'm not here to say that it's wrong what's happening. I'm just saying that we should strive to kind of shed some light into how these algorithms work. We should get better in explaining what our models are doing. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question was whether uh, I can, uh, I can. I, if, is there an example of this uh, of of predictive mo of a predictive modeling um, not being? Uh, sorry, say again. So something being statistically yeah, something being statistically significant. But um, I think the example, and uh, I also uh, recommend that you see the same talk from the actual author of the. Uh, paper. I think the example she uses is um, um, a disparity between, let's say, uh, something that isn't statistically significant but is important for pre for prediction. Is uh, the example she brings is Ptolemaic astronomy. Like uh, it's not based in uh, real theory. Uh, what Ptolemy was saying about how the stars are moving, but it was really useful in. Uh, navigating through the sea and doing everything uh, at the time that this theory was uh, theory was involved. So this is a type of example where something is not necessarily true and does not pass any sort of statistical test, but it's still useful. It has practical utility. Yeah. The other way around, I think f again from what from the talk, um, she used the example I think of string theory saying that there's something that you cannot test if it's statistically significant, but it's uh, obviously of practical utility, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add on this. So uh, if you have a very large sample size, and you're predicting a lot of variables become statistically significant, they're not necessarily predicted in the model. So it's kind of an artifact of sample size again to talk about statistical significance. You want to say the same thing? No. No, no. My <laughs> question, um, uh, is there a theoretical um, constraint between predictab predictability and explainability? Good question. And I think so. Like, okay, the question was uh, if there is a theoretical uh, constraint between constraint. You, it was it was the word like between explanatory and predictive. And I think I would go back to the a area. I think this is where you know my mind kind of goes when I kind of hear that, uh, which is the trade-off between bias and variance, um, where 
and also the previous slide I mentioned about the operationalization of constructs. There will always be a difference between prediction and explanation between, because just because the measurable data we see will always be noisy. It will not necessarily, uh, it will not necessarily represent what we're actually trying to measure. For example, when we're using an IQ score to measure intelligence or where you're using, you're, when you're trying to kind of say a statement that this causes that, and you're trying to measure it somehow, there will always be a disparity because the data will be noisy. And this is where you turn to bias and variance and you're saying actually also mathematically speaking, you will, uh, oh, I mean, there is a different tra trade-off that is going on. When you, when you want to understand something, not make a prediction, you want to get closer to the, to the model, mm -hmm. the model that produced like, the, 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 the truth, not the noisiness. But when you're trying to predict something, you will always kind of minimize something else, which is what actually happens in real life which is not necessarily the actual model. It, it might be something that is close to it, but not necessarily the same. Yeah. I just want to add to that, from a practical, from practical point of view, when you're talking about explanatory variables, many times you do randomized control trials, and these are very controlled uh, laboratory situations, and you're looking at this one particular variable, how that explains some uh, outcome variable. And in that case, you can try to find some kind of model where it explains. But in, in the end, it can only explain 5% of the variation. And it's very hard to come up with a laboratory, laboratory situation when you have so many different features. And I think that's kind of a constraint. I'm really glad that there is some uh, discussion going on, because this is the exact thing uh, that I want to see. If you have any you know, information about this topic, feel free to kind of find me afterwards. I'm genuinely interested in what's, what are the differences, and I'm going to keep looking at it. And I would incentivize you to kind of see the talk and read the paper. Super interesting. What's the title of the paper again? To predict or to explain. Easy to remember the same. <laughs> Anything else?